Please turn with me to the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, and let me read to you from verse 3 all the way to verse 12. First epistle of Peter, chapter 1, verse 3 to 12. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Now last week I said we have started a small series that will just go for a few weeks, maybe five, six weeks maybe, on answers to popular objections to Christianity. There are many objections that are quite popular and you know a lot of them. You hear them every day. And here we give the answers for that. Every week I said we are going to take one, just one of the big questions, big problems that people in our culture, in our society have with the Christian faith. Last week we looked at exclusivity where people say, you guys preach saying that out of all the religions, yours is the right one. And your Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In what way is it productive? This is the kind of thing that produces tension in society. If you say everybody is wrong and you are the only one that's right, you got the one true religion, then that's enough to create all kinds of violence and hatred and all kinds of things. So that is not right, they say. They object to Christianity on the basis of the fact that it is exclusive. It claims that they've got the way, that they have the only way to God. They say, is it not right to preach saying that all religions are pathways to God that lead to God ultimately? Why are you not preaching like that? That will be more towards producing peace and harmony in society. But the way your Lord presents it, saying I'm the way, is going to cause problem, they say. So we addressed that last week. If you haven't heard that, you need to go back and hear that. It's all in Tamil as well as in English separately. Today we're going to go to the second objection that I think is a very big objection and you probably heard this one. And that has to do with the problem of evil and suffering. They say, you say there is a God. Not only do you say that there is a God, you say that he's a good God and that he's an all-powerful God. If there is such a God, good and all-powerful, then why does he allow evil and suffering to continue in this world today. Why is there so much evil and suffering in this world if there is a good and almighty God as you say? If you can put this argument against Christianity on the basis of evil and suffering, in a different way I would say this, if God allows evil and suffering to continue because he can't stop it, then he might be good but not all powerful. On the other hand, if God allows evil and suffering to continue because he could stop it, and yet he won't stop it, then he might be all-powerful, but 
is not good. Either way, the good and powerful God of the Bible couldn't exist. <laughs> if you say he is not able to stop it, then you are talking about a God who is not able, that means not all powerful. If you say, yeah, he can stop it, but he doesn't do it, then you are saying that God is not good. So where is your God? He doesn't exist, they say. How do we answer it? Now this is a very important question, it's a very relevant question and people are pointing to something that they think is a problem. Why is there evil and suffering if there is a good and powerful God? Can't he stop it? Now this is something of a question that is put before us as a preacher particularly and preachers know this all the time because one of the things that we do is we attend functions where sometimes we have to address people who are suffering evil and uh, suffering from something that has happened to them and they're dealing with either death or some kind of thing that's happening in their life. Some unfortunate thing has happened and um, in that connection we are called upon to sometimes just talk to them. Sometimes I've been called to talk to some people that have been terribly distressed by some things that have happened in their lives. And a lot of times I've been called to preach on occasions where people have gone through some tragedy in their lives and they have a service and a, a kind of a service to bring peace and comfort in the family and there we are required to preach. But in all those services, even in burial services and so on, the time is not there. <laughs> it's only about 10-15 minutes and you got to say what you got to say quickly and they got very big questions and you got to answer all of them in about 10 minutes standing in the graveyard on some dirt, you know. That becomes impossible. That is why I thought it will be better to deal with it on a Sunday because you have a little more time to deal with it and you can deal with it more fully. And I hope I can deal with it a little more here. This text that I just read to you, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 to 12, tells us a lot of things about this particular subject. It tells us one thing that you should not do in dealing with evil and suffering in your life. And then it tells us about three things that you can do to deal with evil and suffering in this world that will really work and that will really help you. Let's look at the one thing that you should not do first and then we'll look at the three things that you should do and it will bring a lot of peace and comfort to you when you face evil and suffering. The one thing that you should not do when you're facing suffering and evil is this. When people experience evil and suffering, one of the ways that they respond sometimes is that they back off and even abandon their faith in God. Have you ever noticed that? They'll say, well, I used to believe in God and I had great faith in God, but since this happened, I kind of backed off. I kind of slowed down. I have a lot of questions now. I have a hard time believing in God. Now, I don't mean to say that those people are not good or anything like that. No, it's perfectly natural and a lot of people do it. It's a natural response that people have. Well, I trusted in God. Look what happened. So I'm going to cool off my relationship with God. Just think about it more and I'm not going to go forward with this anymore. I'm not going to be so interested in the things of God anymore. I'm going to cool off, they decide. Now, notice what verse 6 and 7 says here in 1st Peter chapter 1. Verse 6 says, in this you greatly rejoice. In what he talked about our salvation in verse 3 and 4 and 5. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. He says, you greatly rejoice on the one hand about your salvation, about coming to Christ and all that. But now for a little while, since we live in a fallen world and we are imperfect human beings and there are so many other factors that contribute to evil and suffering. It's not just because it's a fallen world, it's complication with us and complication in so many ways. So, in that case, it says, for a little while, it becomes necessary sometimes and things like death are inevitable realities of life. It is something that nobody can avoid, you know. I remember going to a family that has lost their loved one and uh, they have 
recently come to faith in Christ and there were others that came there and uh, they were telling them it seems these people were terribly distressed when i went there because those people were saying look you believed in jesus look what happened this guy is dead and what did you gain by believing in jesus so they were really troubled and i walked in there and i was supposed to pray and then take the body and bury that person so i heard what they said and then uh, i began to speak and i said what has happened here is something that happens in every home it's happened in my home it's happened in every one of the homes of people that are here we've buried our grandfathers and grandmothers and something has happened in our house there is not a house here where they have not had any death every house faces death you cannot tell me about any religion that doesn't have death you know it doesn't matter what religion you belong to you're rich or poor educated or uneducated what background you're from whatever you are good or bad that is an inevitable reality so this thing about look you believed in jesus look what happened is not a very good argument it's not a very good thing to say when people are going through grief so i began to preach and try to bring some comfort like i said you got only about 10 minutes to do that and you can do very little during the time and they are greatly troubled and distressed and i can understand how they will be greatly troubled and distressed and that is why teaching in the church like this in a better setting where you can spend some time is very important now what peter is saying is well you greatly rejoice on the one hand about your salvation but for a little while it becomes necessary that you're grieved with various trials you got to deal with problems of this life you've got to deal with some things that happen in life sometimes some of those things are inevitable it happens and you got to deal with grief you know now listen to this that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of jesus christ in other words what he's saying in essence is he says the pain you're going through now and the suffering you're going through now doesn't have to weaken your faith or destroy your faith it can actually strengthen faith and it ought to strengthen your faith that's what he's saying <laughs> the essence of that verse is that the trials of life the tests of life the things that you go through by way of suffering doesn't have to destroy your faith it can actually strengthen your faith it ought to strengthen your faith so that in the end you'll be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ in the end it will be praise honor and glory now how does that make sense how can suffering and evil not end up destroying our faith we think it's normal to think that suffering and evil will destroy our faith but bible says it doesn't have to destroy our faith it can actually strengthen our faith bible gives a totally contrary view everybody thinks it will destroy faith but the bible says no it doesn't have to destroy faith it will make you to come out glorious it will make you to come out uh, with praise honor and glory in the end when you deal with it in the right way now how is that possible it's possible because as believers we must understand one thing abandoning our faith in god in the time of trouble in the time of grief in the time of pain and suffering is not going to help you in any way it's not going to help the suffering person in any way it doesn't help him to understand what's happening and it doesn't help him to deal with what's happening you know <laughs> i've actually seen it in so many cases when christians don't understand that abandoning faith in god is not help at all you're not going to profit anything from it it's not like you say from today i won't believe in god because this has happened what kind of relief do you get out of it you get any answers at all to your problem to your questions you get no benefit out of it, absolutely nothing i have found that you're even more confused i've actually seen cases where people have lost their mind because something very tragic has happened and they fail to deal with it in the right way in a biblical way fail to do something right and they ended up abandoning their faith in god and uh, their mind 
began to get confused and they lost their mind. I've seen cases where one person lost the mind and then that person became terribly sick and died as a result a short time later. So it doesn't help you to understand suffering, it doesn't help you in any way to deal with suffering. Why it doesn't help? Because when you get rid of God from your life, if you get rid of faith in God from your life, you will never understand good and evil because without God you cannot even talk about good and evil. <laughs> you know, you cannot even discuss about good and evil without God. One person has said this, the only way you can know whether a human law is unjust is if there is a divine law, a higher law from God. When you say something is unjust, this is not right, you can say it only on the basis of a divine law or a higher law from God. You can't simply say it unless there is a divine law or higher law than that. You cannot call something as unjust and you cannot even call something as good. You know, if there is someone higher like God that has stated that it is good, if there was no God, if there was no divine higher law, there will be no way to know whether a particular human law was unjust or not. Somebody can say this is unjust, but that would be according to their standards. Why should their standards be privileged over others? Why should we believe what someone says? Who is there? Are they the authority? You know, that's the way it will go. Let's take it a step further. In a world without God, where you have abandoned your faith in God, say you don't believe in God, nothing is evil. Nothing matters. You know, you cannot designate anything as evil. Why? Now, take for example, people say, well, everything came about because it naturally happened. And naturally happened means it just evolved, it just came about. There's no creator, there's no God, there is no creation behind the creation. It just happened. Nature. And, uh, you know, they teach about natural selection or survival of the fittest and so on, right? So, what is that? How does it work? Whether it is plants or animal life or any kind of life, human life even. The survival of the fittest means the fittest will survive by destroying the weaker one. You destroy the weaker one, if you're stronger, you survive. That's the principle. That's nature, natural thing that's happening. So, according to that, violence is natural. Because by destroying the weaker, only the fitter can survive. So, violence is natural. So, how can you call violence wrong? How can you call something so natural as violence? Eh? It is perfectly natural. So, once you get rid of God, then there is no evil at all. There is nothing called evil. Eh? And there is no possibility of any good existing because how can you say something is good? How can you even talk about a better society, a better home, or a better life? How do you know what is better? Who says so? See, we can't go by anybody's feelings or anybody's belief. Eh? Everyone to himself it becomes. And there's a whole lot of confusion as a result. So what does this show us? It shows us that evil and suffering is a problem, I admit, for those who believe in God. It's not a very easy question to answer. It is a problem to those who believe in God. It's a very difficult question to answer. But I can guarantee you that the problem of evil and suffering is a bigger problem for those who have abandoned their faith in God. They cannot even begin to fathom how big the problem is. It becomes a huge problem. For people who believe in God, yes, it's a difficult problem, but we can deal with it. There are ways to explain it. I'm going to go into that. That There are three ways that the Bible here in this passage shows us how we can deal with pain and suffering. But for those who abandon their faith in God, the problem is huge. It can only result in literally people becoming insane when they get into it, trying to explain these things. It's a bigger problem 
Because if there is no God, who is to say what is right and what is wrong? Eh? On what basis do we even ask for a better world? Eh? So to get rid of your faith in God will not help. Getting rid of your belief in God will not help you to understand it, understand your suffering, or even to handle that suffering. It will not help. Then what will help? There are three ways this passage says help can come. The three ways are this. You have to look back at some things the Bible says are true. You got to look back. You got to trust what the Bible says. You got to look back at some things that the Bible points out to. And we'll look at it and see what it says. Then we have to look ahead to some of the things that the Bible declares will happen. And then we should look into something that the Bible says must be done. So look back, look ahead, and look into something. That's the way to deal with it. That's a simple way to remember it. What do we see when we look back? Let's do that. When you look back at some of the things that the Bible declares, what do you see? Look at verse 7 once again. It's talking about how for a little while in verse 6 it says, though you greatly rejoice in your salvation for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Then verse 7 says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Now it's talking about you going through some kind of pain and suffering or some kind of evil and suffering. And it calls that experience of going through evil and suffering in your life as being tested by fire, as being put through by fire, like metals, like gold, are put through fire. It is an experience such as that. You're going through a fiery furnace, so to speak. Now, think about that. That's an amazing metaphor, and you can learn a lot from it. Are you going through trials? Are you going through difficulties? Are you going through evil and suffering, really, that you find very difficult to digest, difficult to deal with. It's a perfect description, I think. It's like going through the fire. It's a fiery trial. That's the way verse 7 puts it. And it actually happened literally one time in the Bible. You remember that in Daniel chapter 3? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story. A very interesting story. I don't have the time to read it. You've got to read the whole chapter. But it's a very interesting story for those of you who have not read the Bible. Let me just briefly tell you what it is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are Israeli boys. They are part of the group that were taken, talented people that were taken from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar when he captured Jerusalem and took these people captive. He took the best, the cream of the Israeli society so that they can come and work for them there and so on. They hated it, but Jeremiah also sends a letter. Last week we talked about it. Jeremiah also from Jerusalem sends a letter saying, God wants you there. God has taken you there. Don't think it's a captivity. Go plant your gardens and eat from them. Go build your houses and live in them. Go get your sons and daughters married. Settle down there. Pray for the peace of that city. For in its peace, you will have peace. In its prosperity, you will have prosperity. So hearing that, see that's in Jeremiah 29. Hearing that, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and so many other talented young people that were taken captive, went to work in Babylon, and they ended up in very high positions of power in Babylon. And uh, while they were living like that, there was a challenge put before them. These people believe in one God, and they will not, for anything, bow their heads before any other thing. But the king made a big statue, 90 feet high, and a huge thing, and put it before the people and said, if anybody does not worship this, then you will be killed. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do it. And they were reported. There were so many people against them, the locals that didn't like these foreigners coming in and making it good and becoming their officers. They pointed out that these three boys refused to do it, and the thing went to the king, and the king decided to throw them in the fiery furnace, literally. Here in verse 7, it's talking about our life's problems. When we go through our problems, it's like going through the fiery furnace. But it literally happened in the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had to go through the fiery furnace. 
The king was so angry, the Bible says, if you read in the third chapter of Daniel, that he heated up the furnace hotter than ever. It was so hot, it says, that the people that went to throw these boys, they got killed. That's how hot it was. All these details are given there. The people that went to throw them, they bound them hands and legs and threw them. But in the process of throwing it, the throwers were dead. <laughs> these boys fell in there and uh, the heat was so great. And the king, I think from a safe place, looked in and thought they would have become ashes. But he found there were four people walking. They were thrown bound, but they're now free. They're just simply walking in the fire. He was stunned. He called his people and said, did we not throw three people in there? How come there are four? And the fourth one is like the son of God. They said, yeah, we only threw three. We don't know how. The fourth one got in there. Who's the fourth one? He's like different. He's like the son of God. And uh, so they tell them to come out. And when they come out, only three are coming out. So who is this fourth man? Where is that fourth man? Who is that fourth man? Now the Bible gives us the answer about who the fourth man is. In Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Let me read to you from verse 1. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. Now listen, very interesting. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Everybody say, I will be with you. God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. Because I am with you, the rivers will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. He says, because I am with you, you won't be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. Why? In that whole verse, the most important line is, I will be with you. Everybody say, I'll be with you. God is saying that. Verse 1 gives the identity of the person saying it. He says, I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who formed you. Don't be afraid. I'm the one who redeemed you. I'll be with you, he says. And if you have any doubts, verse 3 again gives the identity of this person who will be with them. He says, I am the Lord your God, Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So who is he? Who is the fourth man that was there? Here it says, he's the one that said, I'll be with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned because I will be with you. Nor shall the flames scorch you because I will be with you. It's the Savior, the Creator, the Redeemer God promising, saying that I will be with you. Now what does that mean? What does that promise mean? See, you need to know how to interpret these Old Testament passages in light of the gospel, in light of Jesus Christ is the key to interpretation. How do you interpret it? How do you read the Old Testament promises like this? I'm sure you've heard a lot of preaching about this, this promise, the wonderful promise, oftentimes referred to. But you must understand it in the right way. How do you understand them? What does it mean when God says, I'll be with you? When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Walk through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. What does it mean? It means that the trouble and trials of your life, the evil and suffering that comes to you, it's not about just crossing a river. You can cross a river with a tire, I think, you know. Most people, if you can swim well, you can cross a river pretty safely. You know, you've got all kinds of other aids to cross the river. Even to go through the fire, they've got all kinds of kits that you can wear and go through the fire these days. It is not just about just walking on fire or going through the fiery furnace somewhere. It is not just about crossing a river or walking through a water that is flowing. 
It is about the trials and difficulties and challenges of life. It is about going through the problems of this life, which are like fiery furnace. It is being put through difficulties in life. You're going through difficulties in life. How do you go through it? It's about that. That's the issue. That's the way you have to interpret it. So it means that the trouble and the trials that you face, the evil and the suffering that you undergo, it will not turn you bitter because I am with you. It won't break you because I am with you. It will only refine you because I am with you. It will give you splendor because I am with you. I'll give you a character and a soul and a faith that many people do not have because I am with you. When you come out of it, you will be looked upon as someone special. They'll say, wow, you see the person that went through all that problem, faced all those difficulties, all those challenges? You see the one that went through all those difficulties? Look at him. My God, we thought he'll be finished. We thought he'll never survive. But look at him. He's glowing. He's better than before. He's pure as gold. He's like gold put through fire. All impurities are gone. He's shining better than ever now. He's something to be looked upon. All that because God is with him. That's exactly what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just imagine the scene. You've got to have some imagination also when you read the Bible. When they came out of the fire, even the king stood in reverence before them. He said, their God is the true God. If anybody doesn't worship their God, see what I'll do, he said. The whole thing turned. The king revered them, respected them. These men were glowing testimony to the greatness of God. All they did was just go into the fire and God was with them there. And they came out, not even the smell of fire was upon them. The Bible says that. No sign of any burn, any injury happening anywhere. Not even a small scratch. Came out completely well. They were looked upon as wonders. Why? Because God is there. So what is God saying when he says, when you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, it will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame, the fiery furnace, scorch you. He says, because I am there with you. Don't worry. When you go through it, trust me, I will be there with you. I will walk with you. And I will be with you so that when you come, you will be even better than what you were before. People will look upon you. You will be so glorious. You will be so different. You will have a character of your own. You will be so special in the eyes of everyone. That's what he's saying. Isn't that amazing? Some of you are saying, well, that's inspiring. But how do I know that this is true? Well, let's go to the New Testament. The New Testament, once again we go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. When the Old Testament God says, I'll be with you in the furnace of affliction, not until you get to the cross of Jesus Christ will you know how far God was willing to go to make that promise. Now listen, I'm connecting the cross with that. When God says, I'll be with you through the fire, I'll be with you through the rivers and waters and so on, until you get to the cross and understand the cross of Jesus Christ, you will not know how far God was willing to go to make that promise good. Only when you have an understanding of the cross, you know how far God will go to fulfill that promise saying, I'll be with you. Everybody say, I'll be with you. <laughs> you want to know how far God will go to be with you? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Let me read to you from verse 10 onwards. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Well, we just read Isaiah's prophecy. We read Daniel's story. That is also a prophetic book, Daniel's book. It is a prophetic book, declaring something prophetic. The prophets, the Bible says, the New Testament says, the prophets inquired and searched carefully 
when they prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So the prophets were not prophesying this and that, you know. It's not like some of the prophets, you know, that are prophesying this and that today. No. It is, it is about, they were all prophesying, it seems. This is very key to understanding prophets of the Old Testament. They were all prophesying the redemptive plan of God. How redemption is going to take place. Their prophecies all had to do with, that is why it is called the prophetic scriptures. In 2 Peter chapter 1, when Peter writes saying, well, we have been eyewitnesses to this Jesus. We saw him. We were there with him in the mountain when uh, he was transfigured before our eyes. And uh, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We were with him, Peter says. We were with him, believers. We were with him. We were eyewitnesses of that. But better than what we saw and what we heard. We saw him. We heard the voice of God speaking, saying, this is my son. Better than that, we have a more true word of prophecy, it says. What is it talking about? Which word of prophecy? It's talking about the Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus, how he will come and how he will save. So the entire Old Testament, in a way, was called as prophecy. You have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, Peter is saying, well, what we saw and what we heard is good, believe it, but better than that is the Bible itself, is the Old Testament itself, which is the inspired word of God that talks about how Jesus will come and how he will save. Believe that. That is a more sure word. Everybody say more sure. What is more sure? Some preachers will say, my prophecy is very sure. No, Peter is saying, we saw, we heard, well, we are good preachers, believers, but there's something more sure, and that more sure thing is the word of God itself, the Old Testament itself. It's called prophecy. Sure, word of prophecy it's called. So all of prophecy has to do with redemption. All Old Testament prophetical writings, all of the scriptures is considered prophetic. Even the non-prophetic books, you know, some they designate as prophetic, then some they designate as poetic books, some they designate as patriarchal books and so on. But all are basically talking about how redemption is going to happen through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is about Jesus. That's what it's saying. The Old Testament is about Jesus. Now, if you don't understand that, you will not be interpreting scriptures correctly. Ultimately, it should be about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. So we just read Isaiah's prophecy. Huh? And here it says, it's about Jesus. You look there to find out what it is saying about Jesus. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. When they prophesied, they carefully researched what they prophesied. They couldn't believe their mouths, what they said. They said, my God, I'm saying all these things. What wonderful promise if you walk through the rivers and the waters will not overflow you. Fire, the furnace will not scorch you. What an inspiring thing. What am I saying? What does this mean? They began to research to find out what it means. Now listen to verse 11. Searching what? or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Now it gives more detail about the prophetic scriptures. Not only is the Old Testament prophecies about redemption, it is about particularly the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. There are many, many, many Old Testament scriptures that are about the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you. They were told, it seems, when they were searching and researching what it means. For example, when Isaiah was looking into it and saying, what does this mean? He'll be with me in the water, 
it will not overflow me or fire will not scorch me what god is trying to say when they were searching for meaning it was revealed to them it seems that those things were for the new testament people who will live after jesus after jesus has made ready the salvation it is for us they were told to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven today the new testament preachers are preaching it he says and the prophets of the old testament were told look you just say it never mind even if you don't understand it just give the prophecy just tell them when you cross through the waters i'll be with you water will not overflow you just tell them when you go through the fire i'll be with you and uh, it will not scorch you you don't understand the meaning it's not for you it's for them the new testament christians that will come and live after jesus has gone to the cross and done everything for the salvation of mankind it is for those people when that time comes they will perfectly understand you simply declare it that's what they were told can you believe this so when he was talking about the water will not overflow and the fire will not scorch you he's talking about not some ordinary crossing of a river or going through some kind of fire or walking on some kind of fire he is talking about the sufferings of christ and the glory that was to follow that's the way you got to read it that's the way you got to read it so when you go to the cross now follow with me carefully if you go to the cross see you'll find that exactly reflected there you see only christianity of all the religions of the world says that jesus christ or in jesus christ god became vulnerable and subject to suffering pain and even death just imagine god who made the heaven and earth the creator god all powerful god good god who never did anything wrong and all powerful god who can do anything suffered became vulnerable only in christianity such a god is presented that has become a problem in christianity really you know people say what can kind of a god are you guys worshiping he's hanging on the cross almost naked people spit on him everybody laughs at him they challenge him to come down if he was messiah and he's not coming down and you're calling him lord and you're believing in him and you're ready to die for him what kind of a god is this they couldn't believe that we would believe him as lord and call him as lord and savior that he saves somebody something very difficult to believe that's the thing that people consider very strange about christianity but think about it like this this is the only religion in which the god that we worship is presented as a god who came as a man and not only came as a man but actually died on a cross spit upon beaten black and blue his body became like the plowed field he submitted himself to all kinds of suffering he became like vulnerable to the extent that he became like a helpless little child taking everything that they did against him why would god do that what do you see on the cross see they didn't give him a proper trial no lawyers argued on his behalf things were not considered you know like a court case it was not like a court case that went on and finally a judgment was given there was a mob standing outside crying saying release barabbas to us and crucify this man and because of the demand of the people pilot who found nothing wrong with this man washed his hands off and said i find nothing wrong with this man let his blood be on you i have no reason to convict this man of any crime and give him any kind of punishment because you are demanding i give him to you to crucify him it was basically a lynching that went on that's what you call lynching a mob gathering together thinking that somebody has done something wrong and gathering together and murdering that person that is exactly what happened on the cross just imagine god's son the maker of heaven and earth without him nothing was created he was there in the beginning and before the beginning he was there he is the beginning and he is the end he is the almighty god 
lynched literally by a mob, unjustly taken and put on the cross and nailed to the cross and made to die in that way, submitting himself to that kind of treatment and that kind of death. What does that have to do with Isaiah? What does that have to do with the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar's time? Today, if you've lost a loved one and uh, if you're in sorrow and grief over that, look upon the cross and you can see the father has given up his son, losing his son on the cross of Calvary, giving him up to be lynched, to be killed in that way. If you're screaming in pain saying, my God, my God, why, why is this happening to me? You see a person hanging on the cross in Jesus Christ who says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In other words, in cross he suffered everything that we have ever suffered and much more and more and more, infinitely more than what we have suffered. His suffering was different from all other suffering. See, there's a lot of people that died a martyr's death in those days. Have you heard of the Maccabean martyrs? That the Maccabeans are the ones that lived between the Old Testament and the New Testament, just before Jesus was born. There was a time when a Syrian tyrant named Antiochus Epiphanes ruled in Syria. And he was giving a lot of trouble to the Israelites and troubling them. And some of the people stood up to him. And he didn't like that and he killed those people that stood up to him. And he'll kill them in public it seems. People will gather, Israelis will gather and watch and he will kill them. And the gathered people of God, Israelites will shout to the man who's standing there going to die and say to him, trust in God, trust in God it seems. And as soon as they've heard the word trust in God, smile would come on their face. They'll gain confidence. They'll stand with their shoulder high, head up, ready to die, boldly and confidently. Those Jewish people died like that. Martyrs, Maccabean martyrs they were called. People say, look how they died. What's wrong with your Jesus? He's crying. Look how he's behaving in the garden of Gethsemane. Eh? Drops of blood were dropping on the floor. <laughs> like sweat, the Bible says. And he opens his mouth and says to God, God, if it be possible, please remove this cup, this cup of suffering from me, please remove it, he says. Can this cup pass from me? He's asking this cup of suffering to be removed if it's possible. And on the cross he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Why couldn't he die in a more dignified manner than the Maccabean martyrs or others who have died for a good cause before him? Why can't Jesus do that? Because his suffering was infinitely more than what those people suffered. Yeah, they suffered and they died. But the two things are not comparable. You cannot compare his suffering with their suffering. Their suffering, they suffered and died, that's it. But he was suffering, you know what he was suffering? He was experiencing cosmically what we deserve. When I say cosmically, I mean inconceivably vast manner. That's the meaning. He suffered in a way that you and I cannot even comprehend, cannot even imagine in such a vast suffering, such a vast suffering that he underwent. Why? For example, what is the natural consequence of wanting to be away from somebody? Because that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. What was sin of man? The sin of man was, man did not want God in his life. He said, I'll decide what is good, what is evil. You know, you said I can eat of all the fruit, but not just this one. Why do we need a God for just this one thing? You know, I'll decide that also. Get away from my life. I don't want you. I don't want you to tell me what to do. It's my life. I'll handle it. I have enough knowledge. I'll handle it. That's the sin of man. Sin of man is that man said to God, no, I don't want you in my life. I don't want you telling me. 
I don't want to do what you say. That's the sin of man, basically. Otherwise, what did he sin? There was no Arak shop to go and drink. <laughs> there was no bar to go to. There is no dancing place to go to. There's nothing like that. In what way did he sin? That's the sin. He rejected God from his life. When you have a man that you know and you reject him and say, I don't want you in my life. I don't want to interfere. I don't want you telling me what to do. When you say that, and if that guy is, has any kind of power, he's going to look at you and say, don't ever come before my face anytime. Get away from my face. That's what they'll say. Now, just imagine man saying it to God. And that is a representative man. Adam was a representative man, representing the whole humanity. On behalf of humanity, he's saying, we don't want you. For humanity, I'm speaking as the first man. We don't want you interfering in our lives. Get away. Don't tell us what to do. We'll do what we want to do. God sent him out, locked the gate. He cannot come in, cannot eat of the tree of life. Flaming sword and cherubims at the gate. Nobody can enter. <laughs> now think of that. God putting man away and making the tree of life inaccessible. Locking the gate putting a flaming sword, that means anybody trying to enter will be torn into pieces. Nobody can enter. Take that and multiply it millions and millions of times. That is exactly what happened on the cross of Calvary. Multiplied by infinite number of times, that very same thing. Multiply that distancing that happened on that day when man was put away from God, cut off from God. Multiply that by crores and crores of times. That is exactly what happened on the cross of Calvary. And that is why Jesus was saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Not an ordinary suffering, my friend. Not just somebody just suffering for some cause. Here is one suffering for all humanity for the sin of all humanity, bearing the punishment of the entire human race from Adam to the last man. For all their sins, for all their curse, all the punishment is borne by him. The wrath of God is poured out upon this one man. That's what happened. Jonathan Edwards preached a great sermon on Gethsemane and what happened there. Amazing, amazing preacher he is. Two, three hundred years ago, he preached this. And look at what he says about what happened in Gethsemane. It will really shake you up. He says, The sorrow and distress which Jesus' soul then suffered arose from that full and immediate view which he had of the cup of wrath, which was vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. <laughs> He's talking about why Jesus was sweating drops of blood. Why such sorrow? Why such distress? He says, it came from a full and immediate view which he was given of the cup of wrath, the cup that he was requesting to be removed. God made him to see what that cup of wrath contained. And he saw that it was more terrible, hotter than Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace, he says. What a great preacher this man is. Eh? And he continues, he was brought to the mouth of the furnace that he might look into it and stand and view its raging flames and see the glowings of its heat that he might know where he was going and what he was about to suffer for us. Ah, now you understand why he was crying out like that. Now we understand the special nature of his agony. Now you understand why he couldn't die like others, smiling. Now you understand why it's not possible to die like that. This is infinite suffering. It cannot be measured, measureless in his suffering. Jesus went through that. So when you go to the cross and ask the big question and say, God, why are you allowing evil and suffering to continue? The cross cannot answer you what the answer to that question is. But the cross can tell you what the answer 
to that question is not. The cross doesn't tell you what the answer to your question is. You're saying, why so much evil and suffering is there in this world? Why do you allow it to continue? The cross doesn't answer it. But the cross answers one very important question. I think it's a bigger question. And it answers that. It tells you what the answer to that question is not. In other words, people are thinking that God has allowed his suffering to continue because he doesn't care, he doesn't love, he is not mindful of us, he doesn't care about what happens to us. He has distanced himself from us. That is what they think when they think about evil and suffering in this world. God has forgotten us, doesn't want to have anything to do with us. And the cross tells us, no way, that is not, you think like that, that God doesn't love you, God doesn't care for you, God doesn't, is not mindful of you. How can you think like that? When you see that when Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, he didn't stand there and watch them being burning in the fiery furnace. He got into the fiery furnace. And because he got into the fiery furnace and walked with them there, they came out without being touched by the fire. How can you say that he didn't care, he didn't love, and that's why evil and suffering is happening in this world when he himself suffered on the cross? How can you say that he's the cause behind the suffering of mankind? How can you say God is the one that sends all the trouble and all the suffering that humans suffer today? How can you say that when he himself suffered? Is he the sufferer or is he the one that made everybody to suffer? If he suffered, how can he be the cause for suffering? The cross tells us, no, 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 no. Your thinking is wrong. You're saying God is not love. God does not love. God doesn't care. I got proof of it because he didn't do anything for me. <laughs> no, no. The cross says, no. If he didn't care, he wouldn't have been there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If he didn't care, he wouldn't have said, I will be with you when you cross the rivers and it will not overflow you and the fire will not scorch you. If he did not care, then he would not be there on the cross, his own fiery furnace. That was his fiery furnace. He was put through the fiery furnace. He would not get into the fiery furnace. Why did he get into that fiery furnace? For you and for me. He suffered in that fiery furnace. He hated that heat so much. He hated that wrath so much. He hated that punishment so much so that he said, Lord, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. Yet he got into it so that one day you and I will be completely free from it. We will never anymore face any furnace. We will be in heaven with him for eternity. So put away the thinking. No matter what you're going through, what suffering you're going through, what evil you're going through. Remember, he said, I'll never leave you. I will be with you. And he's with you. Yeah. All right. You have to look ahead to something. Let me quickly cover these things. Look ahead to something. 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to the abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It is talking about our salvation. It says that we are born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead so that we may inherit something that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, kept in heaven until the coming of the salvation. That is until the salvation is fulfilled, completely given. That is with the bodily redemption and everything. The redemption of the creation and everything. That is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we are saved for the purpose of participating in a full salvation, comprehensive salvation, salvation of the creation itself, salvation even of our body later on. We are saved now, given new birth, 
Sins are forgiven now. We are born again now. And the salvation is not over. That's why when Jesus talks about the end time signs, he says, when you see these signs, lift up your eyes. Because your salvation draws nigh. In one way, salvation has already come. Our sins are forgiven. In another way, salvation is yet to come. Because there is one part of salvation that is yet to be fulfilled. Our bodily redemption, the redemption of creation, everything made new and all that. See, you cannot go through life and the furnaces of life, the problems of life, without a living hope. What is the salvation to be revealed in the end times? If you read 21, 22 chapters in Revelation, the last two chapters, it will talk about how heaven will come down and heaven and earth will be mingled together. They'll become one. And everything will become new. So heaven is not where all of us will have some wings and be flying and floating in the air like angels. Some people are imagining heaven like some kind of an ethereal spiritual heaven. No, it is not. The heaven that the Bible talks about is new heaven and a new earth where you, your body, everything about you that has been destroyed, that has been ruined and affected by the fall will be restored to you in completely good shape, pure, so that you will have that inheritance which is described as undefiled, incorruptible, and something that does not fade away. Everything will be renewed. Now, if you don't believe this, even getting old will become a problem. You'll be so worried about getting old, you can, get, you can go crazy. So, oh my God, you know, my hair, everything became white and I'm getting old. Look how old I am. I'm become an old man. Soon life is going to end. What's going to, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> a lot of people go through that. But a true Christian who believes in this thing that the Bible talks about, that we have been born again because we should inherit something incorruptible, undefiled, and something that does not fade away. We've been saved, not just for our sins to be forgiven, but in the end everything will be made new so that I can be young once again, so that I can be whole once again, I can be pure once again, I can live forever and get rid of all the blemishes of sin from my life and live the fullest life possible, the glorious life. When you think of that, everything becomes easy. Even when you face death, yourself or if you face someone else's death, your grief, is not overwhelming, will not overwhelm you. Because you understand that life is not over. When I die, I'll come back again in full form. Amen? Come back again with an unfading inheritance that does not fade away. I will come back again with an incorruptible body, a body that cannot die. I'll come back again undefiled by anything by sin or its effects. The body of sin will not be a body of sin anymore. Totally different kind of existence. Christians are people that have that kind of a hope. We are saved for that kind of a hope. We're not just saved to be just forgiven our sins and go to heaven one day and float around there, no. Heaven is not a compensation for what we lost on earth. Heaven is the restoration of everything that we lost on earth. Giving back everything in glorious shape, in unbelievable form. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about it like this. Let's quickly read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. And talking about resurrection, Paul says in verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. It's talking about what's going to happen in the end. We are headed there. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption and this mortality has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
Have you ever understood what it means to say death is swallowed up in victory? How can death be swallowed up? Why that expression is used? Death is swallowed up in victory. What does it mean when it says death is swallowed up in victory? Let me try to give a little example of that, of what it might be like. All of us have had dreams. Some of us had occasionally, maybe one or two times in our lives, had some very bad dreams that shook us up. Have you ever had a dream where you cried when you're dreaming? Because you saw that everybody that you loved died, some kind of calamity happened, and some disaster took place, and everything that you loved was gone, everybody that you loved was gone. Everything is gone. And you are crying in your dream. Have you ever had that happen to you? Maybe I'm strange. I think a lot of people have that kind of thing at one time or the other. I don't know if it's the sambar that I ate or something that causes that or some kind of thing I watched on television or something. You feel like everything is just gone. Total disaster. You're shocked by the whole thing and being in shock, you're crying literally in your dream. It's, it's become so real to you in your dream that it's like really happening. And then in your shock, you wake up and you see your wife is sleeping there, all the children are fine, the house is there, everything is there, everything is fine. You just had a bad dream. <laughs> now when you see your wife and children and everything being very fine, now you cannot even see them without crying now because the suffering of going through the dream of losing everyone makes this thing of seeing everyone alive and fine makes you immeasurably happy, immensely happy. You cannot measure that happiness. So you cry just looking at them. I think heaven is going to be something like that. I think that is what the Bible means when it says death is swallowed up in victory. All your failures, all the sufferings, all the tears that you've shed, all the blood that was shed, every disaster, everything that took place that so troubled you, bothered you, and destroyed you in your life, every evil and suffering that you went through will be swallowed up when you get to heaven. It will all be swallowed up in the joy of heaven. In light of all that happened, heaven will be multiplied many times by joy and the happiness that you will receive as you enter into heaven, as you live in that heaven. I think that's something that's very near to what it will be like, I think. All this happened in the world, all our disasters, all our Losses, all our sufferings will look like a bad dream. And because you went through this, that will be that much more happy. That will be that much more enjoyable. You know the horror of this, that will be so much more appreciated. That's what is going to happen. Finally, look into something, and I'll quickly say this 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Look into something. To them it was revealed that this is talking about the prophets who were researching what they were talking about. They didn't know what this was all about. They were told it's not for you, it's for them. Just say it. Don't worry about what it means. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you. Through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So those things that the prophets were speaking about in the Old Testament times, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the story of Daniel and the lion's den, the story of crossing the river and not being scorched by the fire and all of that, all of those prophecies are about the gospel, are about the suffering of Jesus and about the glory that was to follow. And those things are being preached now explained now by the New Testament preachers, things which angels desire to look into. That's what I want to pay attention to. Angels desire, it says. The word desire is not a very good translation. They say the word, the Greek word behind it is the word that is often translated as lust. 
Now, lust has got a bad connotation now. It's only about evil things. We talk about lust. But lust can be very positive also. Lust simply means uncontrollable desire, a desire that cannot be contained, immeasurable desire. What it's saying is, the angels desire to look into the New Testament gospel preachers and their preaching because they've been with God for so long. They've been there with God for longer than us. They've gone through the entire history of the human race with God. They've been messengers that carried messages and went everywhere, did things for God, fought wars for God, and did all kinds of things. They know a lot, but they understand very little. They went and told Mary that she's going to bear a child. But they didn't know what they were talking about. They simply passed on the messages. They were like messenger boys. So today, when the New Testament preachers, filled with the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, preach the gospel, they're looking into it passionately, with great desire, without taking their eyes off. They're listening to preaching. So many people have come today. I'll tell you, in heaven, there is a big balcony crowd watching us today. And they are saying, preach on, preacher. We want to hear that. Tell us. Now only we are hearing Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego's story. Now only we understand Isaiah. Now only we are able to understand what this is all about, the prophecy is all about. Now we understand. They never understood it before by hearing the New Testament preachers filled with the Holy Spirit. By looking into it passionately, they understand. If the angels look into the gospel passionately, every day to understand more and more how much more you and I should look. But the problem with the spiritual churches is this. Someone has wrongly told them that the gospel is ABCs. Gospel is very preliminary stuff. You cross over that and go into who's in third heaven, fourth heaven, and you know, what to take off, what to wear. You know, whether you can do this or do that, that kind of thing. That is high class teaching, they think. Someone has led them like that. They think uh, gospel is ABC. I'm still in ABC only. I like the gospel. I like to go back and look into it again and again and again and again. And you and I need to look into it again and again and again. When you look into it, you begin to understand something. What do you understand? How did Jesus went through his furnace of the cross? He went through it in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says that he was able to bear the cross and go through it because of the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him? Isaiah 53, 11 says, Isaiah 53, 11, if you look at it, it says that the results of his suffering you will see and be satisfied. He was told, you will see the results of your suffering and then you will be satisfied. That's why he suffered. He was ready to suffer because he was told, you'll see the results. What is the result? Us, redeemed people. And then Isaiah 53, 11 again says, my righteous servant will justify many, will make many righteous. Sinners will be made righteous. He was told, look, suffer, bear it, wait patiently. Many are going to be made righteous and many are going to come to God, you will see your suffering and the results that it will produce. And that is why he suffered. That is why he went through the furnace. How are you going to go through the furnaces of your life, the difficulties and stuff? How do you pass through that? He made us his thing, you know, his living hope. It is because of us he was able to bear it. And today we are able to go through it because of him. How do we do it because of him? Because we think back on him. We know that he made us his thing. He put us in front of his eyes. Because of us, he bore everything. We know his love. We know the joy that he was expected to receive from it. His joy was us. And that makes us love him even more. And that makes him our joy. And because we want to be with him, because we want never to be away from him, we hang on to him, we follow him, we continue in our faith in him, and so on. And when you do that, what happens? Verse 8, and we'll read this in close. In 1 Peter chapter 
1 verse 8, of whom having not seen you love. When you're going through issues in your life, evil and suffering, you don't see him, but you love him. You know, when the people were told to come out of the fiery furnace, only three came. The fourth man could not see. But God gave a special view for the king. He saw the fourth man. He knew there was a fourth man. Today, we don't see the second person in our life. When we go through the furnace, we don't see him. But we are people who love him. We don't have to see to love, but we love. We don't see him, yet we love him. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, we don't see him, we believe. And we rejoice. See, not seeing and loving, and not seeing and believing, causes you to rejoice. With joy inexpressible, I mean, immense joy, and full of glory. And what that leads to is receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. It leads you to the ultimate destiny of your salvation, the fulfillment of your ultimate salvation, redemption that is complete. Amen? Are you there? Yes. <laughs> Let's all stand up together. Let's lift up our hands and thank God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful grace that you've made available to us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Help us to see the gospel. Help us to look into it every day more and more. Help us to see the glory of this gospel, how much God loves us, how much God cares for us. Help us to see and understand how much he went through his furnace because of us. And we know that when we face trying times, that will help us to go through our difficulties and our problems without giving up our faith in God. We thank you for your love. We rejoice in your love. Though we do not see, we love you. Though we do not see you with our eyes, we believe you. We thank you for the inexpressible joy that is in us as we believe. Thank you, Father. Fill the hearts of people with that joy today. May they ho go home with joy for what God has prepared for them. Thank you, Father. We thank you because you care about us. You love us enough to enter into our furnaces. You are there with us. Thank you for you travel with us throughout this life. You are there every time we are in trouble. Help us to remember that you are there. The trouble will not finish us. The trouble will not destroy us because you are there. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. We pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore. Amen.